All right, we're live. Hello, everybody. So today we have the amazing Ellen again. And Ellen, if you don't mind giving us a quick intro, we can get started here real quick. Sure. Um, I'm a licensed veterinary technician at Nova Cat Clinic, where I have been there since 2002. Um, I perform um, pretty much all of their dental procedures with my team, and we perform well over 500 dentals per year on cats alone. Crazy. And um, we also promote as much feline wellness as possible because our motto is giving cats more birthdays. And you can always find me on my platform on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook as the Cat LVT, where we keep promoting as much feline wellness as possible so you guys can continue having an amazing relationship with your cat. Love it. Thanks so much, Ellen, for being here. So today the topic is anesthesia. And I guess we have an awesome video that we'll start with and then we can get into some of the questions that you guys sent um, because it's a really important topic and the more you know I think the more we're going to feel better about it um, so let's start with the quick video while your cat is having their teeth cleaned well what exactly goes on behind the scenes while your cat is having their teeth cleaned well I'm going to take you on a tour and I'm going to show you everything Dental x-rays, one of the most important tools that we use during your cat's dental procedure. This lets us know exactly what is going on below the gum line. As you can see right here, can't really tell much of what's happening versus we can actually see what's going on below the gum line here. And you can appreciate just how far these roots actually go into your cat's jaw. And why do we do dental x-rays? Well, you can see just how bad this poor kitty cat's mouth is just by doing these x-rays. All of these teeth need to be extracted. Without having dental x-rays, we wouldn't know what we're getting into. We use a wide variety of tools during your cat's dental procedure, from all of the hand tools that are needed for extraction, all the way to the ultrasonic scaling machine that takes off all that plaque and tartar and makes your cat's teeth nice and shiny. What about anesthesia? It's one of the biggest questions that we do have, and it is absolutely 100% necessary for your cat to be under general anesthesia for a proper dental procedure to happen. Meet the team. Who's gonna be doing your pet's procedure? Who's gonna be doing the anesthesia and monitoring? And who's gonna be cleaning your cat's teeth? These are all the people in the practice that you need to know. Anesthesia safety is a must, and there's a lot of equipment involved from your stethoscope to your IV catheter and IV fluids, your blood pressure machine that actually does blood pressure, oxygen saturation, and temperature now, to the ECG, which tells us your cat's heart's electrical function, as well as our capnographer, which tells us a CO2 exchange, and the anesthesia machine itself. I hope that clears up a lot of questions for you. Don't forget to ask your veterinarian if you have any further questions in regards to your pet's personal procedure. Wow, that's awesome. And I'm so glad that we started off with that video because there's so much that goes on when we talk about anesthesia. So I'd love to just break it down, you know, just from the idea of what are we actually trying to achieve with anesthesia? And it's not just being asleep or not being conscious, right? We're talking about pain. We're talking about movement. So what does it mean um, to be anesthetized? Right. So everybody always, you know, and when you talk about anesthesia, they always call it like a controlled death. That's the way it's medically, <laughs> you know, the terminology for it. You're like, wait a second, that's really scary. I don't like <laughs> that. Um, so what we're basically doing with anesthesia is the body is still controlling itself. Okay. Um, it's able to breathe on its own. Um, especially if you're not using a ventilator, that's where we start taking over and that's different surgery that doesn't happen during your dentistry procedure. So the body is still able to breathe on its own, you know, your, your heart rate is still going. Basically, you are unconscious, almost in a, I want to call it in that dreamlike state where you are pain free, you're really not going to remember what happened. Um, we are able to control the entire setting so this animal doesn't have any kind of anxiety. Um, and it's not moving. And that's one of the biggest things is we can't do the fine tuned work in their mouth unless they are absolutely still 
and this is the easiest way to control it and make sure that they have a very safe recovery um, as well because the recovery period is just as important as the anesthetic portion of the procedure. Um, and it can be quite scary, but everything is individualized for each patient. You wanna make sure your patient is healthy. So your veterinarian will do an anesthetic assessment risk and it's like one to five, one being you know, the most benign procedure. You're gonna do great. We don't anticipate any problems to five. It's like, it, this is a do or die situation and the patient may or may not make it. For dentistry, you're always gonna be between that one and three, depending upon what's going on with the other comorbidities that we continually talk about. Um, and so then anesthesia might get a little bit more tricky, but anesthesia has come a long way since I've been in practice since the early 90s that, I mean, most of the drugs are reversible. Um, the majority of them are very heart safe. So you have, if you have a cardiac patient, they can still have anesthesia. They still get monitored appropriately. And you make sure that everything on that animal is working properly. That's why there's so much equipment involved. And I think when people automatically think about dentistry for their pet, they automatically think about anesthesia and it's going to go bad. Why is it so expensive? And they don't get to appreciate actually what's involved in making this procedure incredibly safe. And the majority of it is the anesthesia. So that's, a, a, I would say, like the... You know, the friend no, that you never it. really get to meet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the anesthesia is like the biggest and most important portion of the procedure while they're having something that's elective. But, you know, the anesthesia part, I think, is like the unsung hero that nobody ever really wants to think about. Um, and it's super that's, important. Yeah. That's why usually there's a lot of cost involved with it. Honestly, that's like a really, that's a lot of information that I, I would love to kind of break down for everybody because... Um, just even all of the equipment and the training that you have to go through to be able to administer anesthesia um, in a way that's safe, um, it's a lot. And what essentially we're trying to do is we're taking what the body is capable of and we're saying, okay, right now we're able to control the breathing, the movement, and all of those nerves that carry pain from, you know, whether it's a local procedure or um, you know, the whole entire brain. So it's almost magical, like you say, like what we're able yeah. to do now um, with all these medications. Um, so for you to be able to do, you know, 500 plus of these procedures, um, and, you know, I'm sure you could have probably have the number of having a complication, it's probably very, very low. Um, you know, we always say, you know, the risk of um, having something bad happened to you, the drive to the, your vet clinic is higher than something bad happening to you while you're under right. anesthesia. Um, so do you wanna just give us um, kind of the, um, if you've seen any complications and what a complication actually might look like and you know, what everything that you have there to make sure that nothing bad happens? Right, so that's the reason why you have all of the equipment you have like your ECG your capnographer your pulse oximeter you have people that are that actually trained so we are looking at gas exchanges with your pulse oximeter which is your oxygen saturation you want to make sure that the body okay. is actually having circulating oxygen throughout it and the machine lets us know since the body is we basically went boop I want to control your breathing uh, but we're gonna you know the body's still able to do it and the brain is actually still functioning but with certain anesthetics, you might have a lower respiratory rate. So you might not be filling your lungs absolutely completely. So we do the supplemental oxygen to make sure we still have enough oxygen going throughout your body. So you wanna have like a higher oxygen saturation under anesthesia. Um, your capnographer, what it does is the CO2 gas exchange to make sure they're actually exchanging the inhalation and exhalation properly, that the patient is actually exhaling enough CO2 so we're not overriding the system that way. And it's not inhaling too much um, oxygen as well because too much of, the, of each of them could be a bad thing. So we make sure everything's exchanging properly and then that the lungs are actually functioning as well because the capnographer will um, even give you the respiratory rate. So we can actually yeah. see and match, like, is this cat really breathing this fast? Well, it's breathing really short, shallow breaths. And so the, the um, capnographer could tell us what's going on there. And then we can make adjustments to the anesthesia to either we need the body to actually breathe a little better or we need it to breathe a little bit key, slower. Right? right, and it kind of gives us that idea second. of the, 
Yep, and it gives us the uh, level of anesthetic plane as well. I mean, we can we can see that capnographer move and shift in its numbers. Like, oh, is this patient a little too deep? Is it a little too light? Do I do I want to adjust some things? Um, you have your ECG that gives you the electrical output of the heart. Are we running into any kind of arrhythmias that are abnormal? Um, you know, and then we have blood pressure. We want to make sure that the, the body actually maintains a normal blood pressure. And that's one of the reasons why we put an IV catheter in and utilize IV fluids to make sure we have a nice equilibrium of pressures and the heart's functioning properly that way as well. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that goes into there to prevent us from going into an anesthetic incident that we don't want to be in. So we can kind of look at these little factors, even when you're auscultating your patient, we always do that you know, every few minutes as well, just to double check and make sure that the patient sounds good too, because I firmly believe that while machines are great as a supplemental tool, it never replaces a person who's really trained to pay attention to that patient under anesthesia, you know, including temperature, we do that too, because patients do get cool while they're anesthetized, we wanna make sure they stay warm. Um, and so if I ever ran into an incident, and yeah, there's been times that we have run into an anesthetic incident, um, and it's usually due to a patient that, even though it cleared for anesthesia, the blood work looked good, their physical exam looked good, we had no problems there. You never know um, how a body may respond to anesthesia because there might be an underlying comorbidity that doesn't show up in an exam or it doesn't show up on the lab work. And that's another reason why it's so important to have all of these safety parameters in an exam on the same day as the procedure, because things can change, especially in that. So we even have patients that have like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or other heart diseases that we have to put under anesthesia. There, there's no other choice. This patient needs to be taken care of. We've been given the okay by the cardiologist. Um, We've been given explicit instructions on what they feel needs to be done as far as anesthesia to make it as safe as possible. But there's always that chance that that patient may have an adverse response. And that's why we like to use a lot of our anesthetics are reversible in cats. So we have a crash kit at all times with these patients. The, dr the drugs are pre-drawn up in case we start having an incident. We don't have to worry about um, calculating doses. We have our doses right there and we immediately start reversing the patient and getting it out of this event. Um, and plus, you know, we're CPR certified and everything too. So, you know, we're gonna take care of the patient that way. The majority of patients that I have personally had an incident with have been cats with, with underlying heart disease that we really didn't know about. Or we've had a patient that has had heart disease and they're extremely limited when it comes to anesthetics that their heart disease is so severe but we need to take care of an abscess tooth or something like that. And we have to be extremely cautious on what's happening. And we might have to play with the anesthesia and adjust it as we're actually doing stuff to make the procedure as safe as possible. Um, there has been times that we've had patients have a full cardiac incident. We have had to resuscitate them. Um, we have one that we had an incident with, he went into full cardiac arrest and we got him back and the cat went home several hours later, like nothing happened, which, you know, everybody was like, uh, this is not how it's supposed to happen. He's not supposed to like walk out the door, like, see you guys later. You know, and we've had a couple times that we've had a patient that's had an incident that we've had to send to the cardiologist immediately afterwards, after we stabilized him and looked at him and they're like, yeah, well, even though everything cleared, including their you know, cardiac enzyme tests that we like to perform before our procedures as well, the cat has heart disease. So no tests are perfect, but that's why it's so important to have the team that can actually really think on their feet when it comes to these patients. But, you know, I can say out of all of my years and stuff, yes, I've lost a couple patients under anesthesia, but the majority of them, we catch everything ahead of time. But, you know, I can count maybe on one hand over the course of 20 some odd years of having a uh, an anesthetic event that resulted in the loss of a patient. Of course, right? And and usually it's not the anesthesia, it's the underlying disease. Oh, yep, it's the um, underlying disease. disease. Yep. Um, so I was just going um, to our questions that you guys sent us um, before this webinar and, you know, um, a specific question, you know, mentions arrhythmias. And mm -hmm. I know that, you know, we don't have the full history and we're not able to diagnose and things like that on this webinar, but, um, you know, arrhythmias are fairly common. Right. So just in general, um, can you maybe talk us through, of you know, 
how we think about anesthesia if, if there are heart diseases like arrhythmias? Right. So the most common, um, I would say, cardiac arrhythmia you tend to see under anesthesia is a sinus arrhythmia, which is like the heart rate is a little bit slow. So it's called bradycardia, right? And many times that can usually be due to the anesthetics that are used, especially if you're using something like an alpha two that naturally will slow down the heart rhythm. And so that's where a reversal comes in and you can try to bring back that heart rate. You can also use medications that kind of help bring that heart rate back up, you know, like an anticholinergic, such as like lycopyrrolate or atropine, just to kind of speed the heart rate up a little bit and get things moving. Those are the most common um, normal arrhythmias that you would see, and it tends to be medication related. Now you can wind up having other arrhythmias, such as, you know, preventricular contractions or something else that happens that makes you go, hmm, should this patient really be under anesthesia? And it is it my drugs? Or does this cat have an underlying heart condition that we need to say like, you know what, this dental needs to be what we call scrapped and reverse this patient, get him to cardiology so he can be further evaluated. But an ECG is very fundamental to have done before an anesthetic event to see whether or not that heart is electrically functioning normal and during the procedure because we can actually see how the heart is electrically working under anesthesia and notice any yeah. small changes as we're going along. That's I think you said it perfectly. Like we're we're not going to do something that's going to harm um, right. your patient because it's going to be, you know, always a balance of what's going to help them achieve good quality of life. The dental procedure is likely something that we recommend because we think it's going to help um, either improve their overall health or dental health and eat better and all of those things. So um, if we ever think that the anesthesia is not something that they can handle, we will never go ahead with it. Um, so I think that's really important that, you know, this is something that we have access to. It's a great tool, um, but it's also something that um, in, in rare cases that we will choose not to go ahead with. Um, so a lot, we talked about, you know, the heart and, and, um, making sure that the heart is working well. Um, there's lots of cats that have heart murmurs, arrhythmias, things like that. Um, so can you maybe let's step back a little bit and think about, you know, before the actual procedure, we're under anesthesia, what else do we do to uh, make sure that we're all set, you know? Um, you can think about food, we can think about all the blood work, fluids. Um, what are we all doing there? Right. So, of course, you're going to visit your veterinarian. They're going to do the physical exam. They're going to be doing all that pre anesthetic blood work. And that's like one of the reasons I don't know why I'm doing pre anesthetic blood work. I don't get it. Right. When I go to the human doctor, and it makes you kind of think a little bit. You're like, going, Oh my gosh, I'm going in for this major procedure at a hospital and they didn't do blood work. And my veterinarian says I have to do blood work. <laughs> well, you can give more information to your human doctor than a cat or a dog can give to their veterinarian. So they have to do a little bit more sleuthing to make sure that there's no other problems going on. Um, and they'll get their full physical exam, make sure everything feels right in there because they can have other comorbidities that we'd be like, hmm, maybe this elective procedure is not for you. And we need to focus on this problem, get you healthy to the point that we could put you under anesthesia. So, you know, that's another thing that they have to think of as well. Same day for anesthesia. We're going to do the same thing all over again. We're not going to repeat that blood work unless your veterinarian says we need to repeat it. Um, but we're going to do that physical again, because like I said, you can have your exam and your preemptive blood work, and then six to eight weeks later is your time for your procedure. Well, things can change in six to eight weeks, and we want to double check. We're like, wait a second, I didn't hear that murmur a few weeks ago. Why do you have a murmur today? What, why, what's going on? Are you um, overly anxious? Because cats that have a very high heart rate suddenly can develop like an incidental murmur because the heart's working too fast. Um, are we anemic? because sometimes you can get heart murmurs when patients are anemic. Um, are you developing thyroid disease? You can wind up developing a murmur or a different heart pattern because you're thyroid, but your blood work was normal last time, but it was kind of in a gray zone and we're gonna watch it. But today we have some changes. So we're gonna take care of those changes first before we go ahead and stress the body out again. So there's all these scenarios that come into play. It's just not like, oh, hey, you're here for a dental. Let's go on the table and you know give you your anesthetic and we're done. 
um, you literally have to do it step by step over and over again to make sure that we're doing everything correctly because this cat and dog, they, they can't talk to us and tell us that, you know, oh yeah, by the way, I've been eating a little bit more than usual, starting to howl at night, annoying my pet parent a little bit more. <laughs> Maybe I have another problem. And so this is why it's so important to communicate with your client the entire time because you have to remember, it's, this is an elective procedure unless your pet has an abscess that needs to be taken care of, an oral mass that needs to be addressed, or like a fractured tooth that needs to be, you know, repaired or removed at that point in time. Um, routine cleanings with potential extractions are considered elective, and we want to make sure that this elective procedure is as safe as possible. Awesome. So I'm just going to bring up some of the questions from the audience that we have here. Um, you know, one great question um, we've had a few times today is, you know, what are the important questions to ask um, to make sure that, you know, we are comfortable, you know, giving our pet to the veterinarian to have this procedure done um, and that we've done everything. I think we've touched on this a few times, but, you know, just so that we have it all in one place. Um, what should we be asking about, you know, before right. we even go ahead with the procedure? Right. So you're right as a client. You have the right to know who is the attending veterinarian that's performing the procedure? Because it might be somebody different than who did the exam and blood work on your pet. So you might have Dr. A doing your preemptive exam in your blood work, but Dr. B doing the dental procedure. And then you might have thought it was Dr. A, but it's really Dr. B. So know who's actually performing the procedure um, and get to know them a little bit. Same thing with the um, technical team. Who is doing the monitoring? Who is actually, is, is there a credential technician that's available that's gonna be monitoring, perhaps doing anesthesia, perhaps doing that scaling of the teeth and mapping of the mouth, doing x-rays, et cetera. Who's gonna be helping in recovery? Um, and these are all people that you should know in your clinic. It's just not the, your veterinarian that's there. It's an entire team that plays a role with your pet. And they should be able to answer certain questions for you, kind of like, feel you make you feel a bit more comfortable yeah. that this is what they do and this is their role and they're going to take care of your pet the same way that they take care of them um also like what kind of anesthetics are you going to use that's a big one because they're like we're going to put your pet under anesthesia and you're just like okay and many times in vet offices i feel that they don't want to tell you what kind of anesthetics they use because then you go home and you start googling you're like oh my god my veterinarian said ketamine ketamine's awful the devil and actually, it's not. Um, so a lot of people think that way about these certain drugs because they see all of this um, black tape basically on it online. Well, in certain doses and small doses in cats, when you use them in conjunction with other drugs, it's fantastic. And it gives your pet a more safer procedure, right? Because it keeps them under anesthesia the way we want to, kind of planes everything out. Um, and then, you know, is my pet going to have pain management while it's under anesthesia, which is another big one. Um, is it going to have a short-term um, pain management control or is it going to have long-term pain management control? Mm -hmm. If my pet has extractions, do you guys do local blocks to make my cat's mouth feel more comfortable post-operatively? That's a big one that you should know whether or not your, dent your um, veterinary team is actually doing local blocks to make sure your cat is really comfortable for those first several hours post-operatively when you're taking out teeth. What are you going to be doing afterwards as far as pain management goes? Um, mm -hmm. Do you do multimodal pain management or am I going to only go home with one medication for my pet? And then what do I do if I think my pet is still painful? Um, now, going back to the team portion of it, it's like, you know, who does what in the in the surgery suite with your pet or the dental suite rather? Um, what are their roles? Um, or who's going to come and talk to me afterwards is a big one. Is it just the veterinarian or is one of the technicians going to speak to me afterwards if I have further questions? Do you check on them the next day? So these are all things that you should be asking at your appointment when your veterinarian recommends the dental. Start asking questions right there. And if they say, hey, I'm going to have somebody contact you about this, great. Have your list of questions to get ready to talk to the team member that's going to go over it with you. But make sure it's a team member that actually is part of doing the procedure. Okay. Awesome. Um, awesome. And that's a really big thing that you need to be mindful of is talk to the people that are doing it, not to somebody who is just reading from a script. It's really, really important. That's true. Um, another question that we get a few times is, you know, how often should they 
um, go under anesthesia for dental cleanings? Like, I know this is um, a question that we touched on even in our previous webinars, but I think it's important to realize that um, it's not one size fits all, right, Ellen? Right. And I'm sure you, you notice when you've been in practice that you can look at a mouth one year and a couple years later, it still looks fantastic. Or you can right. do a dental procedure on a cat and then six months later, you're like, wait, we didn't we just do your teeth? Why do I feel like I need to recommend another cleaning for you again? Why are you building up so much tartar so quickly? Every mouth is different on how it collects plaque and tartar and you get all that buildup and your gum disease, et cetera. So it definitely is the not the one size fits all. It's definitely patient dependent. And this is why I'm so excited with the baseball studies that you guys do all the time that you're like cracking the code of like, why is my cat doing this? And why am I the one that has to do a dental every six months? <laughs> or well, I've, my cat's never had a dental in 15 years. Her teeth have always been perfect. And now there's a problem. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it's like a 50-50 chance that you're going to be doing dentals throughout your cat's life, or you might be the perfect pet parent that you're like, this cat's amazing, and I only had to do one dental this entire life. It's never had an extraction. It's like those little and, old ladies yeah. that live till they're 110, and they tell you all they've done is smoke and drink whiskey their whole life. And eat bacon, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that's totally true, and, you know, just to kind of answer that question it's it's we can't give you you know you need to do a dental every six months like you know they do with humans it's really your cat and what you are able to do at home um, so all of those things play a role um, but if we do want to sort of stretch out the anesthesia um, the best thing we can do is taking those proactive steps getting the test checking out what you need to do preventatively um, so that um, I think always is a good thing to do um, so let's go through some of um, the questions here as well. Um, so I think we have a question here. Um, my 10 year old has had many exams and extractions under anesthesia. Um, so when do we do, you know, extractions and how is that um, different in terms of a dental cleaning and you know this is now we're going to surgery and are we doing anything different how long can they be under anesthesia how long is safe um, can you maybe talk to us a, a little bit about that ellen right so every single what they call oral surgery procedure um you don't know what you're going to get until you actually physically do those <laughs> dental x-rays and um I could give an example today for like one of our patients, you know, I was working with Dr. Wooten and my team and we're doing the physical exam first. She's like, oh, I think this, this looks pretty routine. And I was like going, oh no, she said, the, she said the magic words, put the patient under anesthesia and we're doing our dental x-rays. And I was like, oh, well, we need to make a phone call. We're looking at like five extractions here. So what you see on the surface may not reflect what's happening underneath the gum line, because this is where the problem starts happening. So once you actually start seeing an issue with the crown of the teeth, the white parts that you guys can actually see. So once your veterinarian starts seeing like little red dots or streaks on them, that's not gingivitis um, or even like weird little pockets. Sometimes you'll see on teachers, but they're called furcations where you can start to see where there's enough bone loss that you can actually see where the roots split on these teeth. Um, yeah, we have a major problem happening and they all get a dental cleaning that day, regardless if they are having extractions. It's really important to get the debris off of the teeth, get that mouth clean and start new while we do it. So yeah, if your cat's having oral surgery to have a couple extractions, yeah, it should have a dental cleaning at the same time to keep the bacteria count down and to make sure that those pockets and the extraction sites, um, have optimal healing um, so we want to make sure the mouth stays clean but you never know what you're going to get into until you do dental x-rays that's why i always say go to a place that has dental x-rays please do dental x-rays every single time i had a patient today as well that had teeth that looked fantastic in 2019 and now it's 2021 and we're like nope you have extractions today and we can put those x-rays side by side and we can show the client the changes of the teeth on how quickly it happens because you have to remember cats age much faster than people that's right that's right and um you kind of touched on you know the the length of time can depend on right it does it vary it does have. vary 
Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, you brought out the great point that we are always going to call you and let you know what's going on and that, you know, what we find. Um, So it, it honestly is we are trying to limit the time that they are under anesthesia as yeah. much as possible um so you know we're we're going to look for the problems and that's why those x-rays and everything are really important so we know you know we can plan um have all those uh, medications and things so um i mean we've know, had, we don't want to keep we've had multiple under. patients that we've actually have been like oh my gosh this is so much work it would take us a longer period of time to do this ourselves, we're gonna refer you to the veterinary dentist because this is what we do all day long. And some of these veterinary dentists can do like a full mouth extraction in like an hour, hour and a half, which is phenomenal. Versus if you don't have that um, ability to see a veterinary dentist because they're not everywhere and some areas might have pockets that there's several of them. But if you don't, then talk to your veterinarian about maybe staging this dental procedure that you're only going to do one or two quadrants at a time versus doing the entire mouth. So you have less anesthesia time and you revisit it again in a couple weeks and do the other half. It's kind of the same way like in human dentistry works, like they only do certain pieces at at a point in time to give the body a chance to adjust and heal. So those are always options too, is what's called staging. But you normally mm-hmm. we are at our clinic, we try not to keep anybody under for longer than two hours. We're pretty efficient on extractions and cleaning, et cetera. Um, but we don't like to keep our patients under anesthesia simply because, not because just the length of time, but the recovery time, because these patients do get cold despite having them on fluids and on like a thermal blanket and everything. The recovery time goes up when these patients stay under a lot longer. And that's what we don't want. We want a nice, safe recovery for these guys. Absolutely. Um, we talked a lot about, you know, keeping uh, an eye on the heart, previous heart problems. Um, we always get questions about kidney disease because that's also another common um, problem with cats. Um, are we doing anything differently? Uh, maybe fluids? Um, can we maybe touch on a little bit about how we handle kidney disease? Right. So it depends upon the stage of kidney disease. Okay. Um, the nice thing about the newer anesthetics is they're, they're much more kidney friendly. Um, even though they are metabolized in the liver, excreted through the kidneys, et cetera. Um, they're safe enough that the IV fluids that they are on during the procedure, and they should always be on IV fluids during the procedure, is going to kind of help flush the body. Right. There are some cases that some veterinarians will elect to have a patient on IV fluids before the procedure to kind of get body pre-filtering and pre-washing everything out to kind of make sure they're very hydrated. Um, That might not be an option for some people. Um, And then sometimes the procedure is a lot longer because your pet's going to be there most likely all day. Um, There are some cats that need to have some subcutaneous fluids um, post-operatively just to kind of give them a little bit more fluid washout simply because they could be under anesthesia for a half an hour tops, depending upon how efficient the team is. And they didn't get a lot of IV fluids, but the clinicians like, you know, I still feel like they need to have a little bit more fluids to kind of help um, metabolize things a bit better. So they might get some fluids that way. But we see kidney cat patients all the time that need to have their their teeth done. And it's actually healthier for the body because we're, we're limiting that kind of systemic bacteria that can occur that can actually affect the internal organs. And that's what, we, what we're trying to prevent. That's exactly. And I think that's super important to keep in mind because this is a one time thing that we don't do all the time. But when we do decide to do it, it's because it's going to make the pets overall so much healthier that we're actually able to, you know, prolong life and give them a a healthier um, quality of life. So I think it's really important that when we do weigh the risks that we actually think about, you know, a two hour procedure versus, you know, five, 10 years that you get out of um, doing this and then keeping up with proactive um, home care. Um, So I know this is always something that comes up. And I think it's important that we do address it because it's something that exists. It's that um, the anesthetic free dentals. um, And, you know, what is it? And why do we not recommend it? Right. So um, as you saw in the video, (laughs) that cat's uh, teeth that were on the x-rays, his mouth looked totally normal on visual presentation. 
like you couldn't tell like so the teeth that were actually weren't there were already covered with gum line there were no redness to them no nothing so what happens in an anesthesia free dentistry is that they are simply scraping off the plaque and tartar on the buccal side of the mouth which is the cheek side they can't go in and clean the lingual side of the tooth which actually needs to happen as well i can't tell you how much plaque and tartar i wind up scraping away every single day for that as well as doing what we call a subgingival cleaning particularly in these pets that have gingivitis that have a lot of pocketing that we need to address stuff that's up underneath the gum line and pull it out and clean it up now with pets that have significant periodontal disease or really bad gingivitis or these oral resorptive lesions that are really sensitive. So you have somebody going up in there with picks and stuff, pulling things out, it hurts. And so you have a pet that already has a high flight or fright stress uh, threshold, which are cats, you know, they're going to only kind of let you do what they want you to do. Are you really doing a good job? Other than visually removing plaque and tartar there, are you really actually cleaning the surface of the tooth? And then are you actually polishing afterwards to remove the damage you have caused by those tools on the tooth to prevent further plaque and tartar buildup again, or very quickly? And the only way I can describe it is like, if you ever get artificial nails done for those, and the ladies, they buzz down your fingernail, and then they put the other nail on top of it. The reason why they buzz that down is because a rough surface will adhere a lot easier than a smooth surface. So when you're doing anesthesia-free dentistry, that's basically what's happening is you're creating a rougher surface. They can't tell you whether or not, you know, I know they tell you this all the time, no, no, it's, it's perfectly fine, this is what we do. Well, you really aren't addressing the true problem, especially in cats, which is below the gum line. Same goes when you, People like they like to take their fingers and pop the plaque and tartar off. Don't do that. Let it have it professionally taken off because sometimes there might be a resorptive lesion under that piece of plaque and tartar, and now you just exposed it to the world, and now it's going to hurt even more because that chunk of plaque and tartar might have, even though it might be filled with bacteria and stuff, it's probably teeming with it, is acting like a band aid to stop it from hurting as much. So that's why we say always do a professional cleaning with your veterinary office don't cut corners and do an anesthesia free dentistry find somebody who is willing to work with your patient and do it safely so i mean there's so yeah. many different ways that it can be done safely than just you know going and having something anesthesia free done um very similar like when you go to the groomers we're gonna brush your dog or cat teeth and it's like okay once every six weeks that's not doing anything if you're not gonna brush its teeth every single day you're not doing anything. You have to do home care every single day for it to make a difference. Yeah. Sorry, and groomers. We'll come and back to that. <laughs> we'll come back to, you know, you have having done a dental procedure um, at your vet it doesn't mean you're good for the rest of the pet's life. But yeah. I want to make sure that we touch on a couple other um, special cases, you know, age um, and, and weight. You know, how do those right. play a, a role in anesthesia? So age is not a disease. So I don't care how right. old you are. Um, I will put you in anesthesia if my veterinarian says this needs to be done. So I've had cats that are 22, 23 years old stay at my clinic when we do their teeth. They do great, depending upon you know the protocol that we generate for them specifically. And that's really important. Everybody gets an individualized anesthetic plan. It's not a template. Everybody gets their own plan. Same goes for overweight cats. The majority of cats out there are overweight like seriously everybody's overweight now um and it's because of a multitude of problems but if these pets are extraordinarily obese what can happen is that their breathing is compromised because of all of the weight from their top end squishing down on everything else so they really can't inhale and exhale appropriately and that's where the dental team comes into play of well, maybe we need to do the dental cleaning with this pet laying sternal versus lateral. So there's a whole bunch of different things we can do. Do we have to tilt the patient a little bit to get the weight off of the heart and lungs? Um, do we have to be like, you know what? I know this is an elective procedure. I know this is supposed to be a routine procedure for your cat, plus or minus some extractions. We need to focus on weight first and get a pound or two off to make sure that this patient can safely be under anesthesia. 
but it's still doable. There are ventilators out there. If it has to, your pet can be hooked up to a ventilator and then the machine will breathe for your pet. And then we don't have that problem. Being fat doesn't mean that you're a huge anesthetic risk. It means we need to take other precautions. Same as you have kidney disease, same if you have heart disease, everything else. Overweight cats can have dentals. It happens every single day because more than 60% of the household cat are a couple pounds overweight. Awesome. Um, and I think that's really, you know, we should keep saying this over and over again. It's always a personalized plan that we come up with and we change the plan, you know, every second as how they're breathing and looking at all of their vitals. Um, and then, so now we covered, you know, getting into the procedure. Yep. You're, you're qualified to have the procedure. You've had it. Um, I want to make sure that we also touch on what happens after from a dental perspective. So, you know, now we have squeaky clean teeth, everything's good, maybe a couple extractions. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe let's stop there and talk about, you know, what should you be doing after? Should you be brushing their teeth that night? No, not that night. We want you to okay. leave that mouth alone. So especially if you have had extractions, we want you to leave that mouth alone for a good seven to 10 days um, because okay. we want to make sure that those extraction sites have healed. And that's why it's important. So if your veterinarian says, I wanna see you in seven to 10 days to recheck this mouth, go to your recheck point because there has been some times that we have done a recheck and we're like, oh goodness, this is not healing the way we want to. Or you got some food impacted in there, even though we did do um, uh, gum closures on these animals because we'll go ahead and we'll use specific, you know, bone putties, et cetera, to kind of help the jaw kind of form a lot faster versus letting it fill in on its own. Um, and we want to make sure the mouth is comfortable too. So we never leave an open socket. We always close all of our sockets, but we want to make sure that, you know, they're absorbing the suture material at the rate it's supposed to. It's actually healing properly. And then whether or not we are running to any other adverse problems with, you know, the pet eating or is the bite off. So there's a whole bunch of things that we evaluate. So once you get the clear from your doctor, uh, to go ahead and start home care, that's when you can start doing brushing. Um, that's when you can start um, doing other things such as like additives and stuff. But if your pet is eating food, like dry food, yeah, maybe you can handle those dental biscuits that are out there. Might be a little bit too much for them for the first few days. And we always recommend like have some soft food for a couple days if they'll eat it. Um, we don't wanna change food on a cat if they've always been a dry food eater, Cats that have multiple extractions, including full mouth, they will eat dry food the same day. We just need to monitor them a little bit more closely. But you don't want to start doing something that night because we've already created a lot of acute inflammation on our end from all the scraping and cleaning and subgingival cleaning. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like if you if you got a little bit too overzealous when you floss and you're like, oh, my mouth hurts a few <laughs> hours later. It's the same thing. You don't want to cause more discomfort. Um, and so starting it a, a day or two later. After a routine cleaning with no extractions, sure, why not? But like if they've had extractions, you have, wait till your veterinarian gives you the go ahead to, to start home care first. Awesome. And, you know, with home care, we have lots of resources and an awesome video with Ellen as well um, of different, you know, um, you always want to start small with cats and then make sure that, you know, we're not introducing something um you know, all at once. So we work up to it if you've never brushed teeth before, but this is a great, you know, you have a fresh mouth, you know, everything's clean. So it's a mm -hmm. great time um, to start implementing some of those uh, preventive things. And also, you know, um, I just want to mention, um, especially the, with the base pause dental test, um, it's something we also would want to wait, you know, if you've just had a fresh cleaning done, mm -hmm. uh, probably, uh, you know, seven to 10 days before we do that test because what we're trying to identify is the oral microbiome that's natural um, for your cat's mouth, which is what's going to tell us, you know, their risk of developing disease. Um, so having a freshly cleaned mouth, you know, there's a lot of chemicals in there. There's the drugs that we used um, and things. So we don't want to pick up any of that uh, material. So we always recommend, you know, you're either um, going into a cleaning. So we kind of understand um, the state of the mouth, or you've had some time once you've had a, a professional cleaning done, and we get to learn what your cat's mouth is like. Um, so just wanted to mention that. Uh, right, and then a lot of people also mm -hmm. will notice about, um, you know, dental cleaning, they think it's a once and done thing. Um, and they're like, well, I've been doing, I've been so good, I do his teeth every single night, he still needs extractions. That's a whole other can of worms. 
right? So we usually say once extractions start happening in cats, eh, it's probably going to have some more extractions in the future. And you guys are busy cracking the code on why these cats are developing these kind of resorptive lesions in cats, which is really cool. Um, but you might be able to keep that plaque and tartar build up down significantly it's not going to be perfect it never is that's why we go for dental cleanings ourselves because our home brushing isn't what is up to par for a you know a dentist but you still are going to have dental disease as you age over time etc um, and if you have a certain stage of periodontal disease beyond stage two it's progressive. It's just going to get worse. What we can do is kind of halt the speed that it's happening with home care and routine dental procedures. You, yeah, I couldn't have said it better, Ellen. And that's that's the thing, right? There's different types of dental disease. And what we can do really is attack, you know, periodontal disease, which is one of three that we can test for right now. Um, but yeah, tooth resorption, we don't know what causes it. We don't know a lot about it, you know, um, as, as a whole. So um, we're trying to understand that as well. Um, and there's other really um, devastating dental diseases that cats have, but we haven't yet understood, you know, um, stomatitis and things like that. So um, we're always looking to learn and, you know, make help our cats um, do better and, and help veterinarians come up with, you know, new drugs and treatments. Um, so the dental cleaning, it's something that we can do, um, especially if they're at, at an age where it's safe to do, it's something that then you're open to, you know, keeping up with the preventative care. Um, it's just one of the things that we have available now, um, but it doesn't mean that if they do have um, tooth resorption or something like that, that they're prone to. Um, that's not something that we can necessarily um, prevent because that probably has a genetic component as well. Um, but it's good to that know that you're doing everything that you can um, for your cats. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't miss any of the questions that we got from our audience. Um, do you see any questions, Ellen, on your end that you think we didn't touch on? Uh, let me I'll double check a quick real quick. Our, Bear with me. As well. um, Oh, so um, do, do, do. so we have somebody that basically is new to the veterinary field, which, yay, we need more people in the veterinary field. Uh, it's so hard right now uh, being in the field, and we always are looking for more and more people for the support because there are so many more pets that need to be seen. So kudos to you if you're in veterinary medicine right now because we need you. Um, Looking for tips and tricks to take better dental x-rays while the animals in lateral recumbency. The best thing I can tell you is there are so many online training courses as well as veterinary technicians and veterinary dentists that host courses. Take one of them. Um, even some of their live webinars are fantastic. Even it's just for you to kind of figure out how to just change your angles, et cetera. But um, yeah, I mean, there's so many resources out there. The best thing you can do is just keep practicing and taking them. Um, every single patient should have dental x-rays. I can't, I can't tell you how many x-rays I have taken over the course of 20 years, too many. But um, you know, you get better and better to the point that it might take you less than three minutes to do an entire mouth on a cat, which it, it takes us, my team. We're so very efficient in doing it that we know exactly what we're looking at, the angles that we're doing it. But you'll get there and they get the resources out there. There's so many of them and feel free to either message me privately and I can show you some of the resources out there and make you a, a better uh, veterinary technician. Amazing. Um, and honestly, um, I want to make sure that we have some time to get to um, a couple of questions here, but um, we, we always say this, but I, I want to make sure that we mention it today too. You know, if you're looking for products, especially and things that are proven to work, um, maybe you've just had a cleaning done and you're looking to start some home care, the VOHC, the Veterinary Oral Health Care Council has a great list of products. You know, there's foods, there's additives, there's toothpaste, um, all those things that have been shown to work um, to reduce plaque and tartar. So that would be where um, we would recommend that you go to check out um, specific products. Um, there's a question here, Ellen, from Linda. Um, what are some of the considerations in scheduling a dental or holding off for a while? When might a veterinarian say, okay, we can maybe wait a few months before we do this? And, and why might we say that? 
Right, so there might be another comorbidity that needs to be addressed, right? So you might actually have a patient that maybe the blood work isn't perfect and they want to know why, understand, make sure that your patient and their, their patient is actually safe enough to go under anesthesia. We're going to hold off. We're going to, you know, look into this first versus you come in and the mouth isn't, is it awful? I mean, there's sometimes you go in there and you're like, oh my gosh, I wish every cat mouth looked like this. You know, it's perfect. I want you to do home care instead. So sometimes you don't need to be put under uh, general anesthesia simply because there's not enough plaque and tartar buildup and the gum line actually doesn't even have like the start of gingivitis. You can have really good looking mouths out there that maybe they want to focus more on home care versus putting your pet under anesthesia to basically clean off not much, maybe just a little bit of a biofilm. So that could be a reasoning there. Um, and, you know, many veterinarians always, I, I would want to say they, they always look out for their clients in a way. Like, you know, are you financially able to, to do this right now? Or do you want to save your money in case maybe something in the future happens instead? You know, are you physically able to do the home care at home? Can you emotionally handle the amount of workload we're gonna give you at home as well? Because we do give you quite a bit of homework and it can be overwhelming sometimes. Um, so maybe they just wanna start you off slow and that this mouth looks good and let's keep you on a preventative course versus putting you under anesthesia too early. Um, could be some of their reasonings as well. It's very personal when it comes to um, their interpretation on oral health in some cats, but you literally can have some cats that have a fantastic looking mouth and why put them under anesthesia if there's really nothing there for us to really do some significant work with. So it, it very, very, it's very dependent upon the veterinarian at that time. And that's where it's a good time to ask the question, like, why are we holding off on this? Can you show me why? Um, and so yeah. that's where that open door of communication starts happening for you to be able to understand your pet's health a lot better. Great, great. A um, couple last last minute questions for you. Um, you know, what if I have six cats and they all, you know, have some degree of dental disease and, you know, it, it gets pricey and how, how should it, how should you plan for that? What's a good. How should you plan for that? You always put some money aside every single month. Just do it. Um, I believe me, I have been in, in the position when I first started out years and years ago. Um, and believe it or not, you know, veterinary technicians really don't make a lot of money. Okay, people, we don't, oh, we struggle <laughs> ourselves. I get it. You know, sometimes I'm like, Arr! when I see like an estimate from the veterinary dentist, I'm like, oh gosh, would I be able to afford something like that right now? So those are things that, you know, they, they go through my head too. I, I completely understand. Um, if you can afford health insurance for your pet, many of these insurances do cover the surgical portions of dentistry. It may not cover the cleaning portion or the anesthesia, but it would cover it if any necessary extractions, right? And that's why we always say get them on insurance as their puppies or kittens, because then you can track their trends and they're more likely to be approved by these insurance companies to get coverage, right? But I got into the habit of simply putting 50 bucks a month away for my cats. And then I would say, okay, who's the most important right now? Who needs the most work? And then I would go down the line on who needs the most work. Now there might've been some months that I struggled because everybody needed the work, especially when my cardiac cats needed to have some work done. I think I ate ramen noodles for an entire month. But, you know, as you go along and you just get yourself in a system of saying, you know, I have a lot of pets. I have committed to having six cats and they all have problems. They only need medical care. And it's up to me to be able to go, okay, this is it. I decided I'm going to dive into six cats. Well, I'm going to give put 50 bucks away, 50 bucks a month away for you guys. And then we're going to save up. We're going to go from there. Um, there's also care credit that's available out there. There's other secondary and tertiary um, veterinary mm -hmm. um, you know, credit sites that can help you afford these procedures at a lower interest rate than credit cards. So these are things as well to look into and speak to your veterinarian. I mean, be honest, be like, I really can't afford this right now. And I know my pet needs it. Is there some sort of help that you can direct me to? And believe me, many of us are like, oh my gosh, yes, it needs some help. Let us see what we can do for you. I mean, we, we don't want to 
have your pet say, no, you can't have this procedure because we're basically turning a you know, patient away. We don't want that, but we're going to give you some resources there. But, you know, ultimately as an owner, it's up to you to like, you know, put some money away every single month and then figure out who needs the most work at once. And it's more important because they have more co- comorbidities present then, you know, take care of that cat first and then go down the line yeah. to the healthiest one. So it's the sickest one to the healthiest. And that's where you work from, from there. And that's what I did. And I, I managed it. It hurt, but I managed it. And I mean, yeah, we all love our pets and we'll do anything for them. And if we can plan, then we know, you know, this is something mm-hmm. to be expected. And especially with cats, you know, if you're over three, you know, you're going to have some yeah. kind of um, dental issues. So it's good to be planning ahead. Um, Ellen, and they used I to mention that over three yeah, years old. Yeah. There are mm-hmm. some cases that you guys should know about. Like when your kittens are having their adult teeth come in and your veterinarian says, ooh, this mouth looks a little bit worse than what it's supposed to with these teeth coming in. So there are some breeds out there and then the usually the purer the breed, the more likely they're going to run into dental problems in the future. Start when they're kittens. Get start brushing their teeth early. Get the dental care started when they're their they're kittens. In all honesty, then I think you'll have less stress, and you are anticipating then in the future that maybe you'd have some work going on down the line. But yeah, there are there are some cases that it happens before they're three. Sometimes when they're like six months old. Oh, you are the expert. Thank you, Ellen. We love having you. There's so much wisdom that comes from you that we can't squeeze it all into one hour, but um, hopefully everyone was able to learn something and uh, feel a little bit better, honestly, about anesthesia. It's it's something that we have. Um, it's a great tool to have, you know, whether us as people um, going under procedures or um, we have the same level of care for our animals. Um, so it's something that we shouldn't be afraid of, but the more that we can learn about it, the more um, we feel better. Um, about doing that for our pets. Um, And so thank you so much for sending us all of your questions. They were great. Um, So if you guys do have any questions, um, you can always reach us um, and and we'd love to help you out. Um, Thanks again so much, Ellen, for joining. Um, And I think we're going to sign off here um, in just a minute, unless you want to say a last minute uh, goodbye. Oh, no, I, I always I always enjoy have, uh, talking to you guys. I always have so much fun. But, you know, to everybody out there, really don't be afraid of anesthesia for your pets. Have that really honest conversation with your veterinarian and you'll feel a ton better. Ask all the right questions. Meet the people in the team. And I'm sure they'll be able to make you feel a little bit more confident about what they provide for you. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ellen. Take care. Bye-bye.